Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Blaze TV Podcast. It's Ed Kimberley and Stu Collins with you. Uh, and our guest on this edition, someone we don't really need to introduce you to, uh, it's now former Coventry Blaze head coach, Danny Stewart. Um, Stewie, uh, thanks for uh, for joining us again. And um, it still feels a little bit weird calling you former Coventry Blaze coach after all these years, but um, what a crazy couple of weeks it's been, eh? Yeah, I know. Certainly it's been... Uh... A little longer than that for obviously for me with with obviously the consideration and the mental side of things and you know making the decision but yeah it's uh you know still uh at times you know you still find yourself transitioning and and getting used to it but uh look I'm 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 excited for myself I'm excited for the for the challenge ahead and I'm also excited for to see what happens in Coventry as well yeah, no, for sure. So, just tell us about how that move developed. Did it was it something that happened very, very quickly? How did how did that process uh, how did that process develop? No, I think I think it's kind of like a sequence of events. It's uh, going back to last year. I'd had a couple teams contact me asking what my situation was, and it was kind of right after I'd signed a contract, and there wasn't really anything to do. And um, similar this year, I had a couple teams contact me and ask me what was going on, and I just. I pretty much said to them, look, I have another year left on my contract. Um, really, you know, probably nothing we can do. But I think through the final weeks of the season there, um, you know, just things got a little bit, uh, I think the whole year, I guess, in the you know, into the last couple of weeks of the season, I started kind of reflecting a little bit after, you know, a crazy year and, um, you know, did some soul searching after, you know, after the season had finished and just, you know, I pursued one of them, which obviously was that was Nottingham, and just said, Let, "Let's not rule this out." Um, you know, I had I I, I I immediately, sorry, met with Andy and Mike and explained the situation to them, and you know, requested their blessing to pursue the opportunity. And and fair play to them, you know, it, it was uh, it was a tough decision, I think, for both both sides. And um, but we managed, you know, we've we've built up a good relationship over the last eight years, and. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, was something that we, we all felt was, was best and, um, made the decision. So yeah, here we are. Yeah, for sure. And I guess one thing that we certainly felt last season was a, a bit of a coming together of, of the Nottingham Panthers organization and the Coventry Blaze organization. Of course, we both experienced our, our own tragedies, um, something that you, you never want to experience as a coach and never want to experience as, um, part of the, uh, the hockey community. Um, do you think that what's happened over the last 12 months kind of helps you understand each other in a way you know you've experienced that they've experienced that and it, it kind of helps that transition yeah quite quite possibly you know I, I haven't put much much thought into that 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 aspect of it but uh yeah I think you know you know maybe I I think I think for both sides you know a fresh start right um which may may contribute to that but uh I think m more so than anything you know you know my main contact's been with with Omar um, Pasha there and you know I think I think one thing that was appealing to him was he always felt that I got the best out of the teams we had in Coventry and whether they were good enough or not that's a different conversation and um, I think you know people within the league understand I, I think probably more behind the scenes the resources and the budgets and stuff like that and and that all that's not always everything um, and we know that at the top end we know that at the bottom end um, there's a lot that goes into success in this league. And um, I think they just felt that, uh, you know, with what we had and um, that we we got the most out of our teams, this certainly mm -hmm. the last four or five seasons. So um, I think that was the appeal there. And then for me, myself, um, you guys know me as well as anybody. <laughs> I'm a loyal dog, right? And I was Coventry Blaze through and through. And um, but at the, end, at, at, at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you got to at some point take a leap and, you know, and, and I think more so than anything, and, and you know, I'm spitballing here, but more so than anything, I think it was, you know, it might be down to the the tragedies, you know, faced by both clubs. But I think the biggest thing for me was was finding a new energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, with with this new opportunity, um, I felt that 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 it I just found myself getting excited about it. Um, and and then at the same time, me always, you know over the years, putting the, the club and the team first, I thought maybe it was a good time for the the club itself to get a new voice and, and a mm. new energy itself. So, um, you know, that, that's probably the reason why we, we ultimately made the decision. Yeah. And I was, I was reflecting on this as well. And it was, 
you know, Nottingham have had quite a high turnover in terms of coaching staff for the last few years, for whatever reason. You know, you've been with the Blaze for eight years, and I think you know you you're looking to build something new there. They're looking for a little bit of stability. So again, you know that that matchup seems to work quite well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And and you know, although they you know, of course, perfect worlds, this this stability um, works well for both sides. But we both know. Um, you know, I'll have a little bit more resources there in Nottingham. And with that comes maybe some, some bigger expectations. Right. So at the end of the day, you got to go in there and get the job done. Um, and then, like I said, there's a lot of elements that go into having success in this league. It's not just budgets or, or those so forth, but they, they certainly help. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think for both sides, it's, it's, you know, we just felt it was, it was a great match. Um, and, you know, we, we could see the energy in myself. I could see the energy in the club as well. And then even speaking to, uh, you know, some people from Coventry as well, you see the kind of new energy and, you know, the excitement of what's next. And uh, I think it's a good thing for both clubs. Yeah, for sure. And I'll just hand over to Stu in just a second. But I think if you look at it logistically, it makes a lot of sense because, yeah, you're, you're a hockey head coach, but you're also a big family man. You know, you're a father, you're a husband and Nottingham's only, what, 45 minutes to an hour up the road. So, it was it was probably quite important for you to go to a new club that was close. It was a big big contributing factor, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, you know, in the past, I've always been hesitant to to try new things due to disrupting my girls' lives. And uh, my wife Harriet's just got a new job recently in the last year and has done really well with that. And and you know, my little girls are everything, right? So I'm I'm going to be commuting actually from Coventry. So um, this way. You know, it's a new opportunity for myself, new, new for my career as well. And, and their lives don't change. So um, I might have to hide the Panthers car when I come back. <laughs> in the town. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it just, it's worked out great in so many ways um, initially here. And, and, you know, ultimately from here on in, you know, you got to put the work in and then, and then get results. So, um, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to achieve that. Still over to you. You're going to get awfully familiar with the M1, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, maybe if we just uh, reflect a little bit back on just last season, um, and you you mentioned that there were there's a lot of things that go into success in the elite league, and you know resources are one thing, but there are other things as well, and and recruitment's a big factor in that, isn't it? The you know we we've we've mentioned before that recruitment is as, probably as much of an art as it is a science. Um, Early on, Cole Donhauser, Josh Burnside were in, and then you made a couple of changes. And that's not something that you've typically done. You're not afraid of making changes, but making changes early on. What was the rationale behind those changes? Was it simply to find balance in the side? And or what, you know, was there anything else that was sort of looking at those sort of roster makeup? Well, I think I think it goes back to you know, if you know, look at look at previous seasons before. You know, nineteen twenty before COVID, we were up there slugging it out with the the top teams, like challenging for a title. Um, came back after COVID, and I thought we had a good team. Um, we went through a lot that year. You know, COVID illnesses, injuries, suspensions, and although we, you know, we sputtered a little bit at the end and dropped from fourth to eighth, I think in the last week or two of the season. Um, ultimately, overall, we felt we had a good team. Um, we lost our top center that year early on in, in Matt Thompson. And, um, and like I said, I think overall with everything that happened, we we handled it well. And, and I thought we had a relatively good season, pushed Belfast to the brink in, in, in playoffs there. Um, and then, and then obviously 22, 23 phenomenal year. Um, again, standings don't reflect, I think the year we had, 72 points is you know and and again for more than half that season slugging it out with Belfast and Guilford and um you know we uh we stuttered a little bit there you know I think with when when Halby went down for the six weeks we we had an under 500 record when he was gone but then found our form again and and again just kind of let ourselves down in in that first leg of the, of the playoffs but uh and with that I think it creates expectation and, you know, we brought back some guys um, we we thought could maybe be drivers for us this year. We lost a lot of pieces as well. But then when you stumble out, out of the gates like we did, 
um, you know, you, 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 those expectations are, are carried from seasons past and um, it wasn't good enough. So we, we wanted to act on it quickly and, and, and try to get better and, and try to add pieces that we felt we were lacking. And, you know, I think we, we did that with, with the changes we made, you know, at least, you know, in the short term. Yeah. And it, it, like you say, it was um, getting to that point where the team could be sort of challenging again and being competitive and, that certainly occurred on a a night to night basis, and not just with the Blaze, but across the league. There were so many overtime games last season where teams where it was close or one goal games. Is it, have you ever had any sort of experience like that before? No. Was this season completely off the books? Never, never, I never because you know, perfect, perfect thing. What you just said was off the books. I mean, it. it you know, we had so many OT games and then we had the streak of OT wins. And and then all of a sudden you look at the standings and you realize that two or three other teams have just as many, if not more OT games than you. And you're like, this is crazy. And then I think it was somewhere around February or March where uh, Luke Fisher and the media team posted the percentage of one goal games across the league and two goal games. And it was just it was mind boggling how close the league was. And then, you know, we've seen in the last two weeks, five teams fighting for, for essentially two spots in the playoffs and right up until the last day of the regular season, every single one of those teams had an opportunity to get in. And I, I, I personally don't think, and I might be wrong, obviously, but uh, I personally don't think we'll see anything like that again. What do you think caused it this year? Is it parity between the teams? Was it? Was there any other sort of reason behind it? I think there was. I think it was a combination. There was parity, but maybe a combination of some, you know, bit bigger spending teams. Maybe not. Not. I guess getting everything right and maybe bringing themselves back down to the pack and, um, you know, some teams that maybe weren't supposed to you know, doing really well. And I think that kind of even out the playing field, you know, Sheffield was obviously in a, in a, in a, you know, space of their own, you know, it was crazy. They were out of this world this year, but uh, you know, even for large parts, Cardiff Belfast were, you know, you know, down, down with, you know, kind of the battling for second, third, fourth. And um, but I, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of elements that go into it. I think, you know, having, a lot of the similar coaches in the league, more experience gained through that, I think makes teams better. Um, you know, and you, look, at the end of the day, every coach that has a little bit of time um, ends up, you know, creating a little bit better of a club and better team over time. And some get that time, some don't, unfortunately. But um, I thought the goaltending was really good this year. You know, I thought every team had somebody that had the ability to win games on their own. Um, and that, you know, that makes things a lot closer, but, uh, if I could put my thing, my finger on one thing, probably not. And uh, I, I'm guessing from a, uh, you know, head coaching perspective, it's not something that you'd be particularly interested in carrying on. You'd like less stress and, and three, four, five goal wins. Nice and nice and easily done in 60 minutes. It's nice. It sure is nice when you're on the bench and you, you have those, you know, you're in the third period with 12 minutes left and you're up by four and, you know, not that you, not that you kind of settle in and take your foot off the gas, but you know, when you're on the edge of your seat or on the, on the edge of the bench, you know, for 60 minutes, night in, night out, it can, uh, that can do a lot to your stress levels. That's for sure. Thinking about some of, you know, in some of the offensive and, and some of the events this year, um, Kobe Roth's, Michigan goal in Fife. Uh, is that one of the, the the craziest goals you've seen in person? Uh, I, think, I think if you had asked me 10, 15 years ago, I probably would have said yes, but it seems to be, uh, I, I don't want to say common, but it seems to happen every once in a while now. And Kobe's a very, very skilled player. And and don't get me wrong, it was still a wow factor um, when he did it. But uh, yeah, it was, it was an impressive goal. Um and and like I said, he he's a he's sneaky skilled, right? And you wouldn't know. I I I wouldn't I would never have thought he would try to pull something like that. If I'm being honest, because he's pretty pretty direct and and straightforward and plays the right way. And not saying that's not, but it was surprising when he tried that. But man, it was a heck of a play. Did he never tried anything like that in practice? You never sort of saw him sort of 
doing the little lacrosse moves with the puck. Uh, any not not from my not from my recollection. You know, you can ask the guys maybe after you know when practice when the guys are working on individual stuff. Maybe he was trying a little bit, but uh, I hadn't seen and nothing nothing that I had seen you know from the season would suggest that he would have tried something like that. But uh, you know, I'm glad he did. Yeah, it's always a, a highlight to be found somewhere. Uh, Maybe looking sort of overall and and reflecting over the whole season, you know, yes, there was that the the stutter uh, the, towards the end of the season, and we you know we know the background and, and the reasons you know why why there was a bit of a struggle, but getting to the Challenge Cup semi final, being a goal away from Belfast in in the in that playoff um, quarter final, and finishing sixth in the league actually is. is is not a bad season. No, no, I, I think, and I think with the way sport is now, obviously yeah. it's, you still got your, you still got fans that unless you win a trophy, it's a failure, right? Yeah. That kind of mentality. And, and it couldn't be further from the truth. It does. It doesn't mean that when we say that, that's not what our ambitions are. Um, and of course we all want to win trophies, but yeah. um, for me, somebody asked me the other day how I'd sum up the season and I'd say, I said not great, but not bad. That was yeah. that was the best way to sum it up. And there was definitely some some positive things in there, like you yeah. mentioned, um, getting to the semis and yeah. in the Challenge yeah. Cup and and playing tremendous hockey against yeah. Belfast. That yeah. you know what essentially what came down it came down to was one extra bounce for them, um, and that that was the difference in the yeah. series. So um, yeah, a lot lots to to hold your head up high. Yeah. Um, but for me, certainly the the last weekend of the year for those guys to play the hockey they did in Cardiff and home to Guilford um, and then go into Belfast and play as well as we did. And then back home, um, you know, that's something that I'll remember for, for a long time because, you know, those, those guys went through a lot and, and played very, very good hockey when it mattered most. You've spoken to us as well in the past about that sort of continual improvement and always wanting to, to get better every day. What did you learn um, from the 23-24 season that you're going to take with you for, for future years? Uh, I think that it, it, it goes back to, to, I guess, something that I, I, I'm a firm believer in and stress and um, is just the, the daily habits, um, the daily habits, you know, showing up to work every day and not, not taking anything for granted. And um, sometimes during those little spells, you know, our league's a grind and, you know, you get into November, December and you're, you're on an eight hour bus trip up to Glasgow or Dundee, you know, it's very easy to kind of feel, feel sorry for yourself, you know, that sucks. And, but every team has to do it. And I think the teams that manage those situations and, and just get on with things are the teams that um, have the most success or at least the most consistency. And um, I thought there was times this year where we maybe had those little lulls and, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're playing ice hockey for a living. Um, you know, you're generally showing up to the rink every day for three, four hours and, and getting a workout in and, and, and then you're done for the day. There's, you know, you know, I always, I always go back to my own father, you know, working 12 hour shifts as a tradesman. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's hard work, that's graft. And, um, you know, I think guys need to be very, very grateful and fortunate for the position they're in and, and you have to, you have to take that into every week and, uh, and you'll go out and enjoy what you're doing because if you're not enjoying it, that's where the three, four, five game in a row streaks show up and, um, and you, and you need luck and you need some special play to get out of those funks. So I think just the consistency, the daily habits, <laughs> excuse me, not taking things for granted and, uh, you know, just enjoying what you're doing. I think, I think we, we live in such a world where that just that outside noise can come down on your heart sometimes. And um, you got to be able to manage that well. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's very, very wise. Um, I think we can all take a little piece of that, no matter what we do for a living. Stewie, um, I'm, I know you're not much of a sentimental guy, but I would like to pick your brains. on just reflecting a little bit from the eight years you spent with us. Um, because, you know, I think I can speak for Stu as well. Certainly I was on, we were on the journey of development as well through, through that time. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, what do you think um, for you as a coach, you know, through those uh, years with the Coventry Blaze, what do you think the biggest change has been for you? 
Uh, I would say um, the two things I would say is empathy mm -hmm. towards players, staff. You know, everyone's going through their own stuff. Um, I think, and I, what I'll kind of compare it to is maybe back to my, my playing days and my, my first year's coaching through Newcastle and Fife when I was managing both. And there was, you know, I think you have to, you have to recognize, you know, how to talk to people, um, how to handle situations like that. Um, because, you know, you can be, can be a hard ass all you want and there is time for that. But if you're like that day in, day out, um, I think in, in today's society, and this is me being as honest as possible is, you know, the guys are going to, they're going to switch off in October, November. They've heard two months of yelling and two months of, you know, beating them down. It, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, and I think, I think, I think that's the big one being, being, you know, having that empathy, um, you know, trying to understand players, you know, if, if, if a guy's had three bad games, instead of going in and just giving them a lick in and saying, Hey, we need more from you. Maybe understanding why he's played bad three games first. Um, and don't get me wrong. There's different, different elements of it. If it's a lack of effort and stuff, you, you're going to come down on a, on a guy a different way. But if a guy's out there and he's working, working his butt off and it's just not happening for him, um, you know, it's coming down on him is maybe not going to be the best thing to do in that situation. It's, you know, understanding why maybe he's struggling. So, um, that that's probably the biggest thing for me. Um, I think the the second thing probably is 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 listen more and talk a little bit less. <laughs> um, I I can't remember where it was from. It might have been from you guys, maybe in my testimonial or something like that. Somebody asked me uh, what 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 the the Danny Stewart of today would say or do to Danny Stewart. Um, of back in my playing days. And I said, well, I'd beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> right. And, uh, cause back then I knew everything, right. And I talked over people and I thought I knew, and, uh, you just don't at that age. And, um, you know, I like to try to listen and then just try to take in everything from every, I think you can learn a little bit of something off everyone, whether it's your, your staff, your players as well. Uh, people above you, people, you know, not, I don't want to say below cause that's demeaning, but, um, you know, people that have nothing to do with the, with the sport, you know, whether they're working around the rink or, you know, working in town, you can pick up something from everyone. So, uh, yeah, I'd say that's, that, that's the two biggest things for me. Oh, I agree. I think those are very wise, um, for sure. Uh, and, and in fairness, you know, when, when Thomas signed you back in the day, I, I seem to remember him putting a quote together. It might be from Clutes that he was signing a player intentionally that people did want to wail on every now and then, because that was sort of the point. Um, and you definitely achieved that for sure. Um, I, I, just thinking about players and really good players, because you have coached great players in Coventry, haven't you? If you had to just quickly, you know, th you know, uh, I, I guess put your cards on the table for one guy, um, who would be the best player that you've coached? If you can't pick one, um, would you be able to put a line together? Oh. Wow. See, if I answer this, my phone's going to blow up in about <laughs> 20 minutes after this thing's released, right? Uh, but yeah, that's, a, that's a tough one. That's a tough one for me. I'm I'm going to uh, – I know it's boring and people aren't going to like it, but I think I might pass on that one. That's I okay. I here with certain guys thinking that I like them more than this guy. Sensitive souls these days, right? And uh, – um. I, I could I could name a lot of good players that I've really enjoyed working with, but uh yeah, I think uh there, there was a lot over the years and just to pinpoint five right now. I don't I'd I'd at first I'd have to think a long time about that sure. when I piece them in, but uh yeah, I don't want my phone blowing up in twenty minutes after this release and saying, you know, being up guys being upset. <laughs> well, I, I think I think your phone's probably blowing up enough with uh, with agents and, and players uh uh, thinking about coming to Nottingham, um, and you've definitely earned the right to to uh, to wave on that question. But um, I'll give you this one then: if uh, if you had to go back and do one thing differently, what would it be? One thing differently. It's a good question. It's a good question. I'd say I'd say uh, 
obviously coming in my first year, um, you know, on the back of, of the blaze, making it to back to back playoff finals. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think they adjusted the conferences a little bit that year and that was a very tough conference. Um, and I, we just fell short there and that was a tough year. It was a tough year. And we just essentially to play in that conference week in, week out, we weren't good enough. Um, but I don't see that. I didn't, I didn't see that as necessarily a failure. Of course, of course, to myself, I did. Um, but you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a learning curve for me and adjustment. I'd say in season two, um, we had a very, very good team in terms of talent. Um, and I didn't make decisions early on in that season that I should have in terms of personnel um, mm -hmm. Whether it would be letting guys go, firing guys, or bringing guys in and giving them ultimatums, I think I could have handled that situation better. And 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 that's actually the season I think I felt the most that we underachieved. We actually heavily underachieved. And like I said, the first year, we just weren't good enough in that conference that we were playing. Um, the next year, we still had the conferences, but I think MK and Guilford had come into the league that year and um, they adjusted them a little bit. But I really felt that with the talent we had that year, we underachieved. Um, and then from there on in, I think the conferences, they went away in 18, 19, I believe. And, you know, from that point, I think we were over the last five seasons, uh, you know, fifth best record overall from those those five seasons. And a couple of seasons of those, we've scored a lot of goals and been up in the, you know, slugging it up with the big boys. So lots to be proud of. But if, if that's the one thing I would have done differently, it was that season two, mm -hmm. I think I would have managed that. But that's part of learning as a coach. And I think that's why, uh, you know, every coach that has success has time. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's the odd the odd time where a coach comes in and, you know, gets it right, right away. But whether that, that success lasts a lot of times, no. Um, but uh, year or two, I, I would have certainly handled that a lot differently and uh, managed situations a little bit better. Cause I think we, we did underachieve that year. Mm, interesting. Interesting. And what do you think you're going to miss the most? Ah, uh, boy. It's a lot of things. Uh, I think the people, I think the people, you know, it's, that's what you, that's what you're drawn to over that, that much time. And, um, you know, the relationships I had with, with the equipment staff and the physio staff, you, you guys as well, the, the management and off ice staff and, you know, fans. Um, I think that that's what, that's what you'll miss. That's, that's what you're, you're drawn to. That's what, that keeps you loyal at times. Um, it's the good people that that I'll be leaving. So yeah, certainly without a doubt that that'll be it. And speaking of good people, and, and the, the last one from me, Stewie, is it's been a bit a bit of swapsies in terms of the the coaching staff. Obviously, you've gone over to Nottingham. Kevin Moore uh, has come over to Coventry. I don't know if you if you spoke to Kevin yet, um, but it, but it, um, if you were to speak to Kevin and give him one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh get a lot of hats. A lot of hats. <laughs> uh, no, you know what? Uh, I think as, as, as you know what, he, he's got some experience now, obviously in the league and, you know, he, he was assistant coach in the coast. So, um, but you know, when you put that head coaching hat on, it's, uh, it's a whole different ball game, but I think, you know, from what I've heard, I've heard good things about him. I heard he's a smart guy and, and energetic. And, and I think, I think, I think that was big for, for, for Coventry to get somebody in that was coming in full of energy and, you know, mm -hmm. hungry and, and things like that. So I think, uh, <clears throat> I think probably the, the biggest thing for me to say to him and probably I don't need to is just lean on those, lean on the people that are there around you. Um, it's a good staff there in Coventry and, you know, they'll, you know, if you want to get the best out of the guys, you know, make sure you get the best out of them as well. Uh, so that's, again, some wise advice. Um, Stu, have you got anything else for Danny before we let him go? No, I, I just really to say, you know, and I think I sent you, we had a couple of messages back and forth when the uh, when the announcement came out, but just to sort of say it in person and, and, and in public, you know, thank you from us, from, from me and Ed, for, for what you did for us, you know, behind the scenes, the access... You know, it's really helped us as a as a commentary team and and doing the sort of media side of things. And we're we're really grateful for the support that you gave us 
um, over your time in Coventry and um, wish you all the success in the future when you're not playing the Blaze. I appreciate that, Stu. And like I said, I I think that's, that's the, oh, I think all clubs in the UK need to be, you know, have that camaraderie between everyone. Everyone's got to feel a part of it. And that's always something I tried to to instill in, in Coventry. So I'm glad that that fell to you guys and you feel that way. And, and I thank you guys as well. You guys were always supportive of me and, and did your best not to tear me to shreds on the webcasts. And, um, and, you know, I thank you for that as well. Yeah, thank you, Stewie. And Stu, those are great words. Um, I, I couldn't have said those better. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us on on Blaze TV. Um, we'll we'll see uh, Danny uh, a little bit a little bit further down the road on a different bench that we're used to. Um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for joining again, and goodbye for now.